Uh, in this, um, this presentation, I wanted to, to briefly discuss um, the cross leveraging of uh, smartphone based uh, apps and uh, other devices, other mobile devices, particularly wearable technologies. And really this has to do with sort of this notion of, of um, Ethica, the Ethica sy system fitting into an ecosystem of different devices. And as the so-called Internet of Things um, you know, moves forward in a, in a, in a sort of a stuttering way and um, as more and more consumer electronics devices come out geared uh, towards directly or indirectly towards measuring aspects of health behavior, health context, exposures, um, there's a growing number of opportunities for uh, tools like FBI Epi, um, offering rich smartphone apps to serve as as aggregators, um, as aggregators for the sort of information that um, that can be collected by these other tools, but uh, simultaneously cross-linking it with the uh, the sorts of information that are core to the uh, to the Ethica platform. All those streams you saw discussed uh, yesterday, in which you deployed for your studies yesterday afternoon. So the idea here is that. Um, and far from different wearables being their own solitudes, collecting just information on heart rate or just information on, you know, uh, the blood pressure or just information on respiration or, or just a small number of those things and each being interpreted in isolation. The, the prospect here is, is uh, and one that's increasingly being realized, is using Ethica as a an aggregator of sorts so it can pair with different devices using the technology known as bluetooth now you heard uh utterances involving bluetooth previously as a technology for assessing um co-location of individuals proximity of individuals to each other and there was some texture of that discussion and changing standards there but Bluetooth remains a formidable way of assessing the distance of between two uh, devices running uh, the Ethica app. Uh, but here we're talking about pairing with Bluetooth for the sake of communicating. So if a person has a smartwatch, as you'll soon see, see demoed, um, uh, it can connect to the app, to the phone, uh, and communicate to it via a communication channel established over Bluetooth simultaneously with the use of Bluetooth for detecting co-location of individuals. So the smartwatch will be communicating, streaming data to the app over time um, involving the things that the smartwatch me measures. Things like heart rate, heart rate variability, or interbeat intervals, um, uh, which, which contribute to, uh, to uh, calculating heart rate variability, things like electrodermal response, accelerometry, those things will be streamed off of the watch. And one could imagine a similar situation for a number of other, a wide variety of other devices. <coughs> the goal here is to stream it to Ethica. Why? Why stream it to Ethica? Why not stream it back to the mothership for the company that makes the device? Well, by streaming it to Ethica, you cross-link it with other data. You can cross-link it with survey responses about stressors and, and perceived sort of levels of and, you know, affect and, and uh, intention. You can uh, cross-link it with other data from the, from the phone that's not available in the smartwatch. Things like your GPS location, indeed your proximity to other individuals. You can cross-link it to pictures that the user has posted. You can cross-link it to information from gyroscope and accelerometry that might give a clue as to, you know, the posture someone is in, which might be very important for interpreting heart rate variability because heart rate variability is known to be modified. The actual absolute readings are known to be modified with changes in posture. So in short, by, by you know, cross-linking it with the data from the app, 
from Ethica, now you've got a much richer picture of what's going on in addition to the sensors you've cross-linked them. And I argued on Monday that there's a sort of Metcalfe's law applying. The value of that information goes up dramatically with the number of other sensors available because of this crossing, because of the V, the one of the four Vs, remember, volume, velocity, variety. And this is about variety and finally veracity. So, so by linking it up and having ethic go to a stream to Ethica, um, uh, it is um, it is uh, increasing the value of this data, so the value delivered. Uh, and Ethica can also use it, for example, in principle for triggering questionnaires, right? So when your stress level goes through the roof, as measured by one of these sensors, or when it seems when it seems like it could be rising, because there's ambiguities. Certainly, if you just look at EDA, uh, electrodermal activity, it's, you know, it's, it's hard to know what's other types of arousal and what's, uh, uh, what's uh, stress. It can trigger questionnaires that can help disambiguate. It can trigger questionnaires that might be responsive to the particular context. When heart rate, when heart rate rises very high, you might be able to use that okay um, uh, and it's it's cross -linked. now what's the disadvantage here there, well there's a sizable disadvantage and Amin has been working with the disadvantage together with Mohammed's help and that is um, that that this pairing of the two devices this kind of joining forces of the device it doesn't come for free it, um, in order for it to happen there's a little protocol a little kind of um, uh, exchange that needs to take place between the two devices. And, and Mohammed and Amin have worked hard to try to make this uh, straightforward, to allow people to pair up uh, one watch that they'll see uh, as easily as possible. Um, and, um, and, you know, this is, uh, this, this provides a certain amount of, of value. Now there's some other options uh, for for doing this. Um, you know, uh, it is possible um, that uh, on some devices, let's say a, a weight scale that has it's a you know what's a um, what Andrew might call a bog simple weight scale. Um, it's a it's about as simple a weight scale as you get. It's traditional. There's no Bluetooth on it. It doesn't support electronic modalities for communicating. You can still have people, you know, photograph the out, output of it, for example. They're standing on the weight scale, and they can take a photo of the weight that's recorded. Or they can use the blood glucometer that they're using to test the blood glucose level and take a snap of a photo of that. Um, uh, that's kind of a poor man's version of linking in information. But you know, in certain circumstances, it can be uh, can be valuable, and it can give credence to the values recorded. So it's not merely preferred weight or or kind of weight, but it's it's that's the way um, recorded on the on the device. Okay, um, and then there's some potential. Even if you don't undertake this, even if the data from these other devices streams back to uh, Fitbit or to Jawbone or what have you. There's some potential for linking that data in after the fact in an offline fashion. By offline, I mean it's not going on on the wearable device. Um, now that has some shortcomings. Um, what are some of the advantages of wearables? Well, there's added data streams. And as I said, um, it's my firm conviction that the value goes up super linearly and probably roughly quadratically with the number of, of sensors as you, the value delivered as you, as you cross them. Maybe not quite quadratically. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, uh, you can, you can uh, bring heart rate variability, electrodermal response to bear, um, but another uh, to bear together with the other sensors by crosslinking. And now you've got self-report of stressors and pictures of of items and they're self and they're linked in with with this sort of data together with your GPS location, social context, 
it's, it's a lot more uh, rich of a picture. However, there's some added benefits for wearables. Often there's clearer placement on the body for, for sensors. I mean, where people place their smartphones differs a lot. Some people place them in pocketbooks. Others place them in back pocket. Yeah, the others might hold them on a holster on the arm while they're running. Uh, others yet might uh, might place them in, in hip pockets There's, uh, or, or shirt pockets. And that impedes reliable apples to apples direct comparison of data, say on accelerometry, and translating that directly into maps or, or other other sort of measures of, of, of energy expended. Um, so the, the location on the body matters in terms of the values recorded. Whereas often wearables have a clear placement. Maybe it's a it's a shirt you wear which captures um, heart rate and respiration rate. Or maybe it's a watch, and you wear it on a certain hand. And because of that, you can get, you can get more precision about exactly what it's recording um, with respect to this person. And in some cases, they offer higher reliability sensors. For example, the E4, the Empatica E4, has I mean, it's, it's designed to be, provide research quality information with its, um, with its set of sensors, including the heart rate sensor, in a way that, um, that other devices uh, might provide a pale, a pale imitation of. There are attempts to get smartphones to try to measure heart rate through the camera, um, and you know, something can be done there, but it's not going to be nearly the level of precision of something like the Empatic E4. Um, so there can be higher reliability sensors that are more specialized on these devices, not least because they're they're snugly put into um, you know to to your wrist or, or placed on other parts of your body. Um, Often these other these wearables are also retained more constantly with a uh, with a participant. So you know, think about a watch that's waterproof, um, such as Sabine is 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 working with. Um, and you know, while you're exercising, sleeping, swimming, and showering, you can keep it on. You're not going to do that to your phone, right? Um, you're going to be you're not going to be playing rugby uh, with your with your phone in your body. At least I hope not. Um, it might make that phone that was thrown across the room, you know, look like it was handled gingerly. Um, and you know, I'm not sure that you'd play with your watch on either. I, 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 I'd have to uh, see to my um, to my uh, Aussie colleagues to, to determine that. But the point is, you can wear smart watches and other wearables in a broader set of circumstances than you'd be likely to bring a phone. Um, you can, you can use them in a wide variety of, of, of situations. And that partly reflects the fact that they're less, less intrusive. Um, okay, what are some disadvantages? Well, um, there's a number of them. And I've just listed some. I, I suspect Kevin, uh, Amin, Mohammed may be able to, to throw in a bunch more. Um, uh, one disadvantage is you gotta charge them. These aren't devices that run on the air, you know, they, they need a battery. And, and that launch that Amin is, is using, uh, it needs to be charged up, I think, nightly? Yeah, nightly charges. Um, and so there's this added battery worry. It's, you know, you got to now charge the, the, youth, the participant out there at home has to charge several devices. A little bit more hassle there. Cost. Uh, some of these devices can be quite cheap, around $100 for some smart watches. And one of them that we've adapted uh, to good effect and it, with the lab version of IAP, the Mio watch is, uh, I think, somewhere around $100 these days. I mean, it's... It depends which version. It could be one, one and four, depending on which... Yeah. Oh, uh, well, oh sorry? So between one and four, depending on how many... One to four hundred dollars, yeah. depending on which version of it. Um, uh, uh, so the cost can be an issue. The one that Amin is working with is far more expensive. I think it's, it's upwards of $1,500, I think, for a quantity of one. Um, uh, now, the group he's working with that hasn't dissuaded them at some 
hesitancy for purchasing a, a, a number of them, but, um, but it's a big investment. Um, often you need to distribute this with, uh, you know, manually, because lots of people out there are smartphones. A growing, growing faction, even of people who are lower socioeconomic status, they have, uh, they have uh, smartphones. Um, iPhone, Android, you've got a large fraction of the population between those two. Not all by any means, but, but a very large fraction, um, and a growing fraction. Whereas with, with smart watches, you know, you're going to probably have to distribute these things if you want them to be used reliably. Um, and you have to motivate wearing. So for, for a means case, um, strategies that have been used already uh, include, um, again, rendering it as a Batman watch. Um, and, uh, and they're you know, putting stickers on it to get little kids to want to wear it so they're attracted to it. Uh, they think it's, it's you know, a, a nifty little uh, piece of jewelry. Um, also mounting a jewelry on it so the kids can, can chew it. I don't think that's been deployed in the field yet, but it's a plan. Um, so the kids don't bite the watch. These are little kids, two to five. And so they don't bite it with their, <laughs> yeah, in case you didn't, yeah, yeah, in case you didn't need the explanation. Um, they don't bite it directly with their, you know, uh, incisors. They um, or the canines worse, um, but instead they chew on, you know, a, a accompanying, accompanying pieces of, of uh, material. Um, uh, and secondly, so there's, there's the aesthetic barrier. Do I really want to go around with this kind of uh, this uh, watch? And second of all, um, am I willing to take the time? with my fussing baby to try to wrap it around its ankle, you know, on, uh, on uh, every, a couple times a day after I bring it up from its nap and at night, do I really want to go through all this extra work for the sake of this study, um, you know, uh, in terms of, of placing it uh, reliably? Um, uh, there's also this pairing of requirements, and, and Amin and, and Mohammed will, will be showing um, showing this, uh, and uh, uh, you can get a sense of its of its strengths and trade-offs. Um, so, uh, over the years, um, there's been a number of devices adapted for use by the IEPI project, and most recently with with Ethica. Um, they include the Empatica smartwatch for Ethica. Um, Previously, the Mio smartwatch uh, was adapted, which is a lower lower end one. It was the what, Mio Global or something. Or I, I think it was, um, uh, which um, uh, another student worked on, uh, Michael Long, who some of you know. Um, uh, weight and pressure scales. Back in the day, we used Nintendo Wii to to track not. Uh, we could have used it to track kind of balance on the part of individuals, and that would have been a great nice thing for older individuals, but instead we, uh, we used it for weight, for simple weight measurement. Um, and Mohammed was involved in the younger guys in that work. Um, and uh, still looking for a certain password, but um, that's, that's <laughs> Password for what, sir? <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about we'll it later. We'll talk about it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and then there was another lab here uh, run by colleague Regan Mandrick who uh, joined forces with a student uh, who had worked uh, extensively with IEP to, uh, to help uh, create an a, a interface to an EEG um, to measure uh, brain activity using, um, using uh, an earlier version of IEP as well. So um, these are just a small scale. I think in coming years, there's going to be you know, an explosion of wearable devices. There already is taking place. And the big picture here is, there is a compelling, um, there's a compelling uh, value proposition for combining such wearables with smartphones. And, and it's easy to get mistaken that, oh, well, smartphone-based data collection is just one stage, and now we're getting onto the wearables era, and smartphones are going to be left together. No, smartphones are going to contribute on an ongoing basis to the degree they can serve as aggregators that may be very powerful because it's not about the data streams in isolation. It's about cross-linking the data streams relevant to a particular um, 
uh, person at a particular time. And, and there's a lot of potential for Ethica to do it in a way that really adds value, such as by triggering questionnaires based on the wearable findings. Now, in the worst case, if you're working with um, technologies, like Fitbit used to be, I, don't, I even track Fitbit's latest incarnation, where that data is not available um, in a streaming form via an a, a so-called API, an application programming interface. In other words, if, if, if Ethica can't be adapted to directly speak with the device in real time, so it's streaming data from it, there is still this potential in many cases of linking them on sort of when doing the analysis. But it tends to be more involved, more clunky, and it eliminates the opportunities to trigger questionnaires and uh, uh, you know on the fly that, that can help appreciation of, of the data. Smartphones will still be key as far as documenting things, getting user input, et cetera, for the foreseeable future. Okay. Um, any comments uh, from uh, Amin, from Kevin, from Mohammed about that before we see the demo? Are you ready to give a demo? Sure. Okay. Um, uh, so are you ready, uh, Amin? Okay, great. So um, why don't we uh, bring you up here and, and you can make it howl. Okay. Um, okay, so 